everyone, Jack Delahy here, and in today's video, I do something a little different. I'm actually going to talk about effect horizons, what that means, and eventually how this relates to college planning. So let's dive into it. We're going to start out here on kind of more, I'm going to talk about life in general, because effect horizons are everywhere in life. And then in the second half of the video, I'm going to show you how this relates to college planning. So if you really just want to know actionable steps that can help your high schooler and college planning, you can skip to the second half of the video. But in a kind of ironic way, by doing that, you will be shortening the effect horizon. And so I actually recommend, if you can, watch the whole video. I think it's going to help a lot. All right, effect horizons, what are these? I think this is something that is really, really important to understand just in life, but I also don't think enough college coaches in this space talk about this as well and make their high schoolers aware of it. So what is an effect horizon? Well, as you can see here, I've got a little graph and I'm gonna draw on it. Now, what this means is when you take any action, here's kind of typically what you see. I get my squiggle. Okay, here we go. And if you take an action right now where you say, okay, you know what I really want to do right now? And this is a very common kind of uh, teenager thing. They'll say, I really want to play Xbox right now. And so in the moment when you go and you decide to go binge Xbox for four hours, guess what? That feels pretty good. It feels awesome. You're binging Xbox, playing Call of Duty, FIFA, NHL, whatever you're playing, right? But then here's what happens. In the long term, right, that decision likely ends up negatively impacting you. And, you know, there's balance in life. So I'm not saying that, you know, playing Xbox at all is like the worst thing in the world. But in general, right, if you decide to play Xbox right now, that feels a lot better than like studying. But over the long term, right, what probably would have done you better is studying. Now, let's talk about the reverse, which is in the short term, if you're like, oh, I just really don't want to study right now, but you suck it up and you study. Guess what? Studying kind of stinks. Not too fun, right? But then guess what happens? In the long term, the consequences of studying, eventually you do well on a test, eventually you do well in that class, eventually, I mean, we could go on and on, right? Because you study well. You continue to do that, you get into college, right? So the long-term effects of studying and studying well are positive. You can relate this to many, many things in life, right? I'll just do it from a more kind of a general perspective. The negative is, okay, it's 9 p.m. and you're like, I'm really trying to get eight hours of sleep every night. I see a lot of adults who, who deal with this situation too, but you're like, oh, but I really just want to watch one more episode of my TV show. And you know you've got to get up at 6 a.m. So really, if you want to get your eight hours, you should go to bed. But you binge it, you watch that episode of TV. Well, guess what? Feels pretty great. Right? Or as I film this, you know, March Madness is on. Some of the games are late. Like, I really want to watch that last game. All right, positive. But then guess what? The long-term consequences, you know the deal. You get You don't get eight hours. You get seven or you get six. You start to feel bad, and if you continue to do tasks like this, it obviously compounds, and you're sleep-deprived. Okay? Positive, negative. Negative to positive. Typically, the actions in life that aren't as ideal in the moment have long-term positive effects. Right? I guess you could even say, in some extent, right, me setting up this, this video and actually like taking the time to set this up slightly negative but i'm hoping the long-term effects are it helps you all out and obviously then ideally i feel great helping you all out now that's not really a great example because i actually genuinely kind of like making these videos but you get the point if i didn't like making these videos that would be the case so let's give a couple examples i actually remember <laughs> one of the first times like one of my first memories as a young kid experiencing this was if my mom watches this video she's gonna remember this too we went to a restaurant in uh, massachusetts called fireflies it was like my favorite restaurant growing up barbecue incredible and i remember going into that 
to that night, like being super pumped for Firefly's barbecue. And I remember how much I ate. You know, I was a tiny little kid. I mean, we're probably talking, I was like, I don't know, nine, 10 years old, something like that. And I ate so much and it felt so good. And I then, I remember asking for dessert and I got dessert and I stuffed myself and it was amazing, incredible meal. And then I remember in the car ride home being like, oh, I'm so full. And then I truly have this memory of lying on my bunk bed at home, just going, mom, my stomach. <laughs> and that was actually a fairly short window, right? Over the course of like two hours, I went from this to by hour two, I was down here. Positive in the moment, negative, you know, long term. Now, the reverse of that is I actually remember one of my first moments that I actually went and proactively chose this path. I was in fifth grade and I really, really wanted to get on the board of the mile run record at our elementary school. And there were five places. And I remember just being like, I wanna get on that board in the top five all time ever in the mile run at the elementary school. And I remember for weeks I would after school take my bike to the to the track in town center and I would practice the mile run and that was not fun practicing a mile run as a fifth grader but I knew that I really wanted this mile run record and so I practiced multiple times would take my bike go and practice and I wasn't quite getting there but I was improving and then eventually over many weeks I practiced and then the time came and it it was gym and we went to the track and I ran the mile and I remember I got the on the board I was I think like fifth place but that was enough to get on that board that board where they take like your name tag and they type it out on a placard and put it in and I remember being so incredibly proud and right so that was like this moment right here was actually running it and getting the record and then obviously experiencing that incredible profound joy of saying like I worked for this to get to this moment. That was pretty cool. And, you know, as I think about it, that, you know, young kids, you're not instilled with this kind of like long-term thinking like that. And so that was kind of one of those first moments that I remember seeing that occur. And that was pretty cool. And that, that was one of the first times I really felt how powerful the positive effects of a decision like this are. Now, one more example that's actually much more recent is Here's my program, and I, as, so a little bit of background, a few years ago now, I was starting to have to say no to a lot of families who were reaching out and trying to be in my program. And the reason for that is because my program until 2019 or so really was only these two categories, tier two and three. It basically just started with coaching and then there was kind of a supportive community. But the point was, it was not, I couldn't work with high quantities of, of students and, and parents and support them. So I was saying no, like every single week to new families who heard about the program and wanted to join. And I just had to say no. And so I really put my brain together and I said, okay, is there a method that I can do to basically like still provide the personalized support while also being able to help more families instead of just saying no to them? And the answer was pretty clear. It was that I needed to structure my program differently and add this tier one where I created a digital curriculum for students to go through. And then in addition to that, provide unlimited mentorship and support and the, the community, which would allow basically, if I set up a curriculum, them to kind of almost have these railroad tracks where it was guiding them through the process in a manner that applies to any high schooler. And then of course there are nuances where it's personalized and you know you have to give them motivation, et cetera. But it would allow me to basically be able to take on you know more families. When I thought of that, I was like, this is daunting. If I wanna create this curriculum that's gonna last and guide students and parents somewhere between a two and four year time frame, right? Basically throughout all of high school, it's gonna be a big curriculum. And it took me two entire years to build out the curriculum. And here it is. 
It's called the Com College Confidence Roadmap. And as you can see, every single one of these are lessons. And I created 51 lessons over the course of, it took me two years to build this curriculum. And each of these videos are somewhere between five minutes and 50 minutes. I'll just click on one here. You can see this is how they all work. Right? This one's 15 minutes and they always come with lessons and exercises. And the goal is to basically have this be the stepping stones that students take that would allow this to serve as the baseline for students. Now, that, creating those lessons, 51 of them, I'm not gonna lie, at some points, that was painful, right? Every day when I'd wake up and be like, okay, time for another lesson, gotta outline the lesson, draft it, figure out how best to relate to students so when they watch the video, they can have immediate action items, create the downloads, the worksheets. It took a lot. But over the course of two years, I went through all of this. And actually pretty recently this year, I was able to see, right? And then I had students who joined the program and then they went through it. But even then, in terms of like reaping the benefits, right? ultimately the goal is to see student success. And so it took a long time for me to go through, go through all this negativity have students join, have students go through it. And then actually pretty recently, right, I've got kind of my first couple rounds of students who have gone through it. And a student of mine right now who's a senior, like Massimo, went through the entire program, 51 lessons, and he was just accepted to Cornell. Pretty cool. I am now in this zone. <laughs> but it took a while. All right? It took a while. And uh, this obviously brings up a bigger theme, which is typically in life, the positives of this are so much more profound, right? I mean, this line I could keep drawing up and up and up. If this is playing Xbox, this is what happens when you, you know, succeed at a long-term goal. It's powerful. It is motivating. But I will tell you, time, right? Time is here on the x-axis. In order to experience this, look at how much further out we have to go. So, you might be saying, okay, Jack, enough of that life stuff. <laughs> what does this have to do with college planning? Trust me, it does. Because as we get into it, okay, there are four main categories in college admissions. I've gone through this in many of my videos. You can go back and actually see some previous YouTube videos where I've talked about several of these components. They are high school grades and the rigor of classes taken. Number two, standardized test score. Number three, the college essay. Number four, what I call your story. Now, today what we are going to talk about is we're going to talk about category one. Why? Because it has the longest effect horizon. And just like this chart shows, if done properly, it has the single greatest positive effect on college admissions. It is the most important factor. What's interesting is college coaches love talking about the college essay and to some extent love talking about standardized tests. You know why? It has the shortest effect horizon. Now it's not ridiculously short, but like what I will say is on the college essay front, you know, a student could write a killer college essay in a day. Now, I don't recommend that, but when you compare that to high school grades, which have to take four years, four years to a possible day, or let's even say you take, you know, my program college essay writing is six weeks. We go through start to finish how to write your essay over the summer, six week period. Compare six weeks to four years. And you realize very quickly why in the college admissions world, in the college coaching world, there's a huge emphasis on categories two and three <laughs> because it just has the shortest effect horizon. It's the most fun to talk about. Talking about something that you work diligently, step by step, small baby steps at a time for four years, to be honest, it's not that fun, right? Humans want quick results. How we're built. There's a reason why social media is so addicting because you post an image and you get a like in 20 seconds, right? You get that quick dopamine spike. It's not long-term, it's short-term gratification. And so 
I'm not saying these aren't important. I've done an entire webinars with Larry Chung about standardized testing. It's the second most important factor. I just see an abnormal amount of talk about two and three. And I, it's my belief this is why, because they have the shortest effect horizons. If I were to take this, if I were to take this, like if this is the college essay, this, right? Like the college essay still does has, have aspects of this. Writing it while writing it stinks. But like if this entire thing, the time is six weeks, Okay, writing it, bad, 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 bad. Six weeks done, okay, upload it to the Common App, look at this. This, keep dragging, keep dragging, keep dragging, keep dragging. I mean, you know, we could go on and on and on and on. You get the point, but like way more, way more. So triple what I just did is high school grades. This time, this time, High school grades goes way further out. And so this, this like negative work stems for so much longer, right? But then at some point, you're gonna start to see the benefits, right? So I hope that that graph makes sense as to why I wanna talk about this. Now, a couple things, first of all, in my entirely free college confidence community. It's entirely free. I'll make sure I link to it in the description. So far we've got, how many people do we have in here? We have 179 parents who are getting benefits from this community right now. You can take a look. We have people who are commenting, asking great questions, providing thoughtful answers. That's in the community, but then there's an entire classroom to it that I have, and I have a 45 minute lesson on how to basically study in the classroom and how to work on this. I'm going to highlight some of my favorite lessons right now and talk about the importance of them because this is the longest effect horizon and it has the most profound effect in college admissions and not enough college coaches talk about it. They love to talk about how do you write a killer college essay? I'm not saying it's not important. They love to talk about how do you get a 1510 on your SAT? Not saying it's not important, but there's a reason why they highlight it. Because you can go from talking about it to results in the shortest amount of time. Larry Chung talks about standardized testing, the sweet spot for like studying and getting your ideal scores about nine months. Again, that's not a short amount of time, but when you compare it to four years of college admissions, again, shorter effect horizon. College essays, six weeks. Now your story, that also, if done right, has a fairly long effect horizon. And we actually talk about that. And again, I'm not gonna go into that in this video, but if you are interested in that category four, your story that has a long effect horizon, I actually have two lessons here in the College Confidence Community classroom, two entire videos on that category four of admissions and how to set yourself up, your high schooler up, in the best possible position for success. So long-term, they're building a thoughtful story that college admissions cares about. But for the rest of this time, I'm gonna talk about actual actionable steps so students can work best with the long time horizon that is high school grades. So they can actually put themselves in the best position for success in category one. Because I'm just gonna break it to you. If a student can write the best college essay ever written in the history of mankind, and if they don't have the high school grades, they're not gonna get into where they want to. That's just a fact. Parents of high schoolers, real quick, and then I'll get you right back to this video. If you are finding value from the video, I have one request, because I'm never gonna run ads on these videos, I promise. And so my one way to really share these videos to the masses is to ask you for a favor. Do you mind sharing this with any other high school parents that you know might need help? You can do that by directly sharing, like via, you know, just texting the link to the video, or you can also share on your socials, like Instagram or Facebook. It would mean a lot to me. And lastly, if you're really, really getting value and you want to make sure that you're subscribed, you can click the like button, the subscribe button. It'll help the algorithms let you know when my next video is released. Now back to more value. So let's actually talk about some actionable steps. So actionable step number one. And again, if you want to watch this more in detail, you can go into the classroom. You can click the classes are king module and I have a 45 minute lesson on these, but I'm going to run through them briefly. I'm gonna give you my, I don't know, six or seven top tips here. 
to make sure that you understand how best to stand out in category number one and take this back to your child if they implement even just one of these i think it's going to drastically help them first 50 minute chunks 10 minute breaks i've briefly talked about this on some of my other youtube videos but when you're dealing with a long time horizon that is four years telling a student study well for four years i mean come on even as a 31 year old now that would be daunting thinking about something for four years my you know, example of even creating this over the course of two years was daunting to think about. I can't even imagine doubling it. So break that down into small actionable bits. So instead of focusing on the four years, you're focusing on just like this portion, 50 minutes, right? And you can say, you can do this for 50 minutes. It also doesn't hurt that tons of the like books on efficiency and brain capacity, et cetera, that I read, say the human mind studies most efficiently in 50 minute chunks with 10 minute hard breaks. And that's actually even more the case for teenagers. Now, in the world of social media and you know technology addiction, et cetera, some high schoolers might not be able to do this, which is crazy to me, but it is the truth. That is what phones have done to our brains. So an alternative if they want is 25, five. 25 minutes on, five minutes off. Now here's the critical part of this, to actually do the breaks. Because what I see sometimes is students will like, they'll set a timer, they might even actually legitimately do the 25 minutes, but then when the timer goes off for their actual break, they kind of just sit around at their desk and like maybe look at their phone, but are still in the same mind state of like kind of working. Remove yourself from working. So if you're doing 25-5, Put your phone away for those for working work for 25 minutes set the timer if you get bored at the 13 minute mark sorry sit there right you'll probably realize that you actually rather study than do nothing but when that alarm goes off take a real legit break get up from your desk stand up go downstairs go eat some food go give your mom a hug go check instagram if you want go walk around the block the point is make this a very legit clean cut break. That is what will reset your brain and the willpower to actually return. If you do this, if you do 50 tens or 25 fives, and you do this for two or three or four chunks in a night, you are going to be blown away at how much you can get done. Because the alternative is the way probably 99% of high schoolers study these days, which is phone next to them, constant distraction every two or three minutes. That is brutal for your brain to try to process information in that, in that way. Second that you can combine with this is airplane mode. Okay, airplane mode. Take your phone when you were doing these chunks and put it on airplane mode. When you were in this 50 minute chunk, take the phone, put it on airplane mode. Turn it off, put it in a drawer if you want. But even if you have that thing and it's dinging, etc., even if it's not dinging and you know it can like access something you're going to want to use it put it far far away and actually use airplane mode you will be shocked at how you feel like your brain is changing immediately when you don't have distractions to go at. and these days right i say phone on airplane mode i mean if you're using a laptop the same applies like don't be like oh my phone's on airplane mode so i'm going to access my iMessages from my macbook like you get the point right do whatever you need to do to make it so the environment around you is the least distractible possible. Help yourself. Don't make it so your phone's right here and you're like, oh, I just won't touch it. That's brutal. You have to use willpower. Like, get that phone on airplane mode in the other room in a drawer. And then, guess what? When it's a 10-minute break, go access your phone. Go for it. Talk to people. Text people. FaceTime them. Whatever you want. Make it so the break is real. But when you're working, study on air. All right, now, that's cool. We've talked about the environment set up for this category one of admissions. Now let's talk about how you actually should study. A lot of my lessons here, by the way, come from Cal Newport's How to Be a High School Superstar. Um, let's see if I can just Google this right now. Okay, here it is. How to be a high school superstar. 
I'll link to this in the description. Um, there are actually several books I've talked about before, but I think this one actually kind of does a good job at consolidating a lot of his advice from his like earlier book, which is How to Be a Straight-A Student. And he puts this note in there, which is the quiz and recall method. A lot of high school, hate to break it to you, is memorization. A lot of high school is. I think much more of high school is than college, at least in my experience. It's the way that most of our, at least public schools in high school, uh, work, but I do also know I have a lot of private school students in my program and they tell me as well. The best way, far and away, not even close, to study if there's any type of memorization on the test is the quiz and recall method. That is, okay, these aren't note cards, these are sticky notes, so just act like these are like, um, you know, small note cards. You have a question, you put the question on the front. You have an answer, you put the answer on the back. You do that for every type of question. I mean, this works really well in like uh, social studies when they say, okay, what date was whatever, right? What, who was the president when this occurred? Um, you can go on and on, right? This works really well in, if you're doing like, you know, kind of early level math has some of these where it's just like, okay, you need to know your, you know, in geometry, your, your triangles, right? You've got your three, four, five triangle, and then you've got all your other ones. You might just need to memorize the, the you know, 12 different triangles that can work. Um, but no matter what, right, you can just identify, like, even in the sciences, you know, when you're taking biology and it's like, what are the components of a cell? And it says, okay, this is the powerhouse of the cell. And like on the back, you can put, it's like mitochondria, right? Um, there's a lot of areas of high school that, to be honest, are just memorization. And I see students struggle. They're like, okay, I'm just like reading the textbook. And no, take those questions that you know are memorization questions and get them into this form. Not textbook reading, hoping that your brain remembers form. Then here's the beauty of this, okay? You've got your stack. So you've got your full stack and you've got, no, we'll do this. Here we go. Rip it off. Okay, so we've got 50 questions and you've put question, answer on the back. Now, guess what? You've got a pile on your desk of questions that you don't know the answer to. So then you, number one, you know, when did Christopher Columbus sail the ocean blue? 1492, right? Oh, I knew that one. Guess what? Now that goes in the I knew it pile. And here's the best part about this. There is an end to studying. There's an end. I'm actually going to type that here. It's so important. When you do this, there is an end to studying. So many students don't know when they're done studying. You know when they're done? When it's like 2 a.m. the night before and they're exhausted and they're like, okay, I think I'm done. The beauty of the quiz and recall method is if you get all of these questions into quiz and recall method form, there's an end. Because right now, if I have 50 of them, I have 49 in this stack and I have one in this stack. If I go here, what is the question? Oh, here's the answer. Oh, I didn't know that one. To the left stack, right? Now, here we go. I knew this one. To the right stack. Didn't know this one. To the left stack. Didn't know this one. To the left stack. And most of the first round, you're not going to know. So now I end it, I've got seven that I knew, and I've got 43 that I didn't know. Guess what you do? See these seven? Done. Don't think about them. It's actually the very end when we'll do one more recap. Now I'm going through 43. Oh, go through them all. Okay, here we go. And, oh, let's see. I actually knew a good amount there. I knew 12 more there. Okay. So I put the 12 there. Now I've got the rest of the stack. Now I do it again. At some point, you're going to get to a point where you have 50 here that you knew. Congratulations, that's a huge moment. Then, guess what? You have one final round. Go through all 50. Make sure you actually get 50 out of 50. Oh, I got 49 out of 50. One goes back. Here we go. I do the one. I get it. Now, go through again. 50 out of 50. I got 50 out of 50. I am done studying. I feel confident. If it's 9 p.m., guess what? I feel like I can go to bed. This is huge. The quiz and recall method. Now, again, in this book, Cal goes through in detail how to like best utilize the quiz and recall method, so I highly recommend it. Um, but this was huge for me senior year of high school when I adopted it, and then I used it throughout all of college and did very, very well with this. Highly, highly recommend the quiz and recall method. All right, number four, 
understand the end goal, grading, working backwards. Every teacher is different. On day one, they'll give you the syllabus. I did not know this until senior year of high school to even like think about this. When I saw the syllabus and it was like, all right, you got all these readings, you got all these quizzes, whatever, I treated everything equally until I understood this. I was like, oh, there's a reading, I better do it. There's a whatever, I better do it. Like Cal Newport goes to a next level in his book here and he actually talks about don't do all of your reading, <laughs> which I actually kind of like. The, the point of don't do all of your reading is actually assess the end goal. Think about how grading in the class is gonna work. Because if, if these reading assignments of yours like let's say you have reading and the teacher assigns readings every single night and the readings are taking 45 minutes and you realize that the quizzes on the readings only add up to 1% of your grade. I'm like exaggerating here. I don't think that would be the case, but the point is, right? And oh, by the way, the readings aren't going to show up on any test or quiz or, or anything. Then you've got to think like, that's only 1% of my grade. Sure. There is an innate value in just the importance of learning, etc. I get it. <laughs> but high schoolers typically have very minimal time. So understanding the angle and working backwards might allow you to say, you know what? I understand that perhaps today I'm not going to do that 45 minute reading because it's only going to lead to 1% of my grade. And just so you know, in my coaching, in my program, I would say bravo, because that means a student understands the end goal. Now I'll give you the reverse scenario, which happens actually a lot which is that like the mid-year is worth 25% of the grade and the final is worth 50% and everything else is worth 25. So you better believe if that mid-year is worth 25% and the final is worth 50%, you better believe that if you're going to study, you better study well, efficiently, productively for those tests because they make up a massive portion of the grade. Inputs to outputs, right? Inputs to outputs and the output of that is massive. So not all components of a class are created equal. I didn't realize this until senior year. Cal Newport also talks about this in his book, but understanding the end goal, looking at the syllabus saying, how am I going to get graded throughout, throughout the entire year? And therefore, where am I going to allocate my time and efforts? There's only 24 hours a day. If you're a high schooler, you, I, you absolutely should minimum be sleeping eight hours a night and you know, given teenagers are growing nine or 10 possibly. So now if you think about it, right, you're at what, 16 hours a day, you've got class, you've got after school activities, you've got sports. I mean, there is such a finite amount of time to study that understanding the angle is imperative for prioritizing your studies. This is kind of funny, um, but show them this video, show them this graph, okay? Show them the earlier graph before I kind of, <laughs> you know, drew all over it. But this relationship, typically the actions that are annoying, hard, difficult in the heat of the moment are the ones that long-term lead to profound positive effects. Typically the actions in the heat of the moment that are fun, enjoyable, binging that TV show, playing Xbox, are the ones that are going to be detrimental in the long term. And I think if you just even show them this chart, it might, they might have a light bulb moment. Maybe. I hope. That's why I'm making this video. In addition to showing them the chart, it's one thing if they have a light bulb moment, but guess what? That light bulb moment could be right when you show them this video and then life goes on. So I recommend, if at all possible, see if you can work with them. Get them an accountability partner. Accountability partners are really, really good to have. I myself, as a 31-year-old, have one. Her name's Emily. She's great. She calls me every Monday and we talk about what I'm trying to accomplish for the entire week. I can't even imagine how much better I probably would have been at high school, at least in my first three years before I kind of had a, had a revelation. And I've got a video back that I made in December where I kind of talk about that if you want to go check it out. But giving them a long-term accountability partner, whether that's a peer, right? Maybe they have a friend that they really trust that like is good at school and cares and having that accountability partner, even if it's just once a week, a five minute phone call where they say, hey, like, what are your plans for the week? What an accountability partner does is it helps you understand the big picture, the four year plan and not the, uh, what are you going to do today? Because today, if your mindset is only today, let me tell you, for me, if my mindset was only 
today as a high schooler, I'm playing Xbox, all right? I'm going to my friend's house. I'm not studying. So see if they can have an accountability partner. Maybe it's a sibling. Maybe it's a peer. Um, maybe it's you as a parent or guardian. And maybe it's someone else, all right? And this is why in my program, as I've, you know, I told you, I built it out and it's taken a long time to understand how best to give the value, but I've understood how all of this is great. Everything I went through is great. The information is great, but ultimately having a little bit of a push every now and then from an accountability coach or a mentor, et cetera, is absolutely critical, which is why in our program now we have mandatory check-ins to basically keep students on track. So that even knowing all this, right, even knowing all this, they're actually doing it. And it's amazing to see the results. I mean, you get results like that, which is pretty cool. So that's it for this video. I hope that this helped. If you found this enjoyable, feel free to click the like button, click the subscribe button. That'll let the algorithms know. Uh, so it shows you the next video. And I'll link to some of these resources, like I said in the chat. At the very least, if you're watching this video and you're like, oh, this was cool. This was helpful. Do me a favor. Bring this back to your child. The reason I make these is I want to help as many high schoolers in the country. And so I, if you show them this graph, I think it really will. Lastly, if you as a parent are interested, I have an entirely free online community. It's free. You can see there are 179 people in it right now. Um, pretty cool. And parents are getting a lot of value out of it. And in that classroom, I have an entire lesson on the classes are king module which goes into detail about other items that i didn't discuss here in terms of how to do best in the classroom things like how to get an a on every paper things like what i call the b plus rule and many many more so i hope you found this enjoyable i'll put the link to join this community in the chat in the uh, description and lastly just know i don't accept everyone in the community i really want it to be valuable and so there are going to be a few questions if you apply to join that I'll have you answer. And if you answer them and I think we're a fit, I will personally review your application, accept you, and then you can have all the value you want out of this. Hope this helps. And until next video, have a good one.